Well, good morning, church. What a great day it is to worship in the house of the Lord. We have a lot to be thankful for. Our Savior is alive and worthy of your worship today. So come on, let's stand, let's sing, give him the praise he deserves this morning. Come on. And wandering into the night, oh, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this vagabond. And I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And now when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I. Because you heal my heart and change my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior, and I thank God. Come on, get your hands together this morning, church. Come on. Hey, hey. Come on, we sing. I cannot deny what I've seen. I got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning. All I got, she's in the wind. So, so long to my old friends. Old burden and bitterness, you can just keep it moving. No, you ain't welcome here. From now on, yeah. And from now till I walk the streets of gold, I'll sing of how you saved my soul. And this wayward soul is found. You heal my heart and change my name and forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, and I thank God. Oh, come on, if you've been set free by the blood of the Lamb, this is your testimony, this is your truth, this is what your faith means today. Come on, and hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am free. I know that hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Oh, I am free. I know that hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. Oh, I am free. And hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free, oh, I am free Hell lost another one, I am free Oh, I am free Because you picked me up, you turned me around You placed my feet on solid ground I thank the Master, I thank the Savior Because you healed my heart and changed my name And forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master and I thank God yeah. oh, 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 I thank God Come on, 
get up, just get up out of that grave. Oh, get up, just get up. Oh, get up out of that grave. I'll give God some praise today. Sure. 
can hold you down Cause there's nobody in that grave now In one hand gets to wear that crown Well cause there's nobody in the grave now And no enemy can hold you down and Cause there's nobody in the grave now In one hand gets to wear that It's empty, yes it's empty When there's nobody in the grave now Nobody, there's nobody in the grave now Yes it's empty, there's nobody in the grave now Father we're thankful for that truth today The grave is completely empty the tomb, the stone's been rolled away. And that's truly what makes you the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the only one worthy to wear the crown. The king, the holy one. So we worship you in spirit and in truth today. The king, the king. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not fade and by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me oh we praise your name 
the King of Kings. In what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And all precious is. Nothing but the blood of Jesus And all oh, precious is the flow And that makes me white as snow No other fountain Nothing but the blood of Jesus And nothing but the blood of Jesus Father, we thank you We thank you for the blood that has flown in our place. The perfect, sinless, matchless blood of your son. Blood that atoned for our sins. Blood that paid the gruesome price that our life deserved to pay. And blood that has led to freedom, to mercy, to grace, to second chances. Blood that has led us directly to you, Father. So Father, I pray today and the days to come that we just, we sit in what this week means for us in our faith today. That we sit in the, the days, the hours, the minutes that led to the blood being shed. But Father, I pray ultimately that we sit in the freedom that the tomb represents. That yes, blood was shed, but shed that we may have grace and freedom and mercy today. We love you. We worship your name. We all pray this morning, church. Amen. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise today. Yeah. Well, good morning, church. We're so glad you're here. If you would take a seat. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. Crosslink Community Church, a community of refuge and hope for all people and that will always and forever include you. My name is Savannah Smith. I'm on staff here at Crossland and, and we know that because you're here, you made today worshiping with Christ, with community, in this community a priority. And we will never, ever, ever take that for granted. If this is your first time here, we would love to know that. To your right or to your left, if you are in our room, is a card. Just take that out and fill that out. It says, I am here on the front. We just want to at least know your name and your address. I promise we're not going to send you anything crazy. We just want to send you a thank you letter for being here today. So please, please do that. Online community, we're so glad that you are here this morning. Thank you for tuning in, for joining us. We know that you made today a priority too. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. There is a um, QR code that's about to pop up on your screen. I think it's right below me. If you would scan that QR code and you can fill out that I am here card just the same. Let us know that you were here or tell your online host Ty this morning. Morning. We would love to know that you're tuning in today. Well, I don't know if you know this, but you might know this, but today is Palm Sunday. We are leading up to one of the most incredible Sundays of our faith, Easter Sunday, but today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem 
that he knew what was gonna happen and no one else did. And, and so many crowds gathered. A large, large crowd gathered as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem that Sunday. And I don't know how you potentially are here or why you're here, but there's a large crowd here, right? And some of us come to church for so many different reasons. Maybe you're here because someone dragged you out of bed this morning and said, come on, we're going to church. You gotta come, get dressed, brush your teeth, come on. Maybe some of you um, were bribed with good coffee. You know, if you come here, there's good coffee. So that's why you're here. Maybe some of you are here because your kids were like, like, hey, mom and dad, we're coming to church today. And so you're here because of that. I don't know, some of you are here because of someone in your life whose faith was just so prominent, so exemplified in your life that you wanna do the same. And so you're sitting here today in this crowd because of those reasons. I don't know why the people gathered in Jerusalem on that day. They wanted to come and see Jesus, I do know that. They wanted to know who this Jesus was and why he was coming and what he was doing. Some of them have heard, had heard of the uh, miracles and amazing things that he had done. Some of them came for many other reasons. They did not like Jesus, but they came for different reasons. And you're here today for different reasons. But I do know this, we are all offered the same gift. Jesus came with one purpose. He rode into that city with one purpose. He was headed straight to the cross and he was coming to die for you. You gathered here today, he came and he died for you. We read earlier in this series, we're in Matthew, right? This entire series, but earlier in chapter 13, it says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it. And he hit it again and then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and he bought that field. Jesus Christ is our greatest treasure, y'all. I don't know what you discovered when you came to church for the first time or if you're here for the first time, I don't know what you're discovering right now. Those people that day discovered Jesus Christ. Today, here in this place, you can discover Jesus Christ. You can. He is offering you life because he laid his down for you. I don't know what's gonna maybe keep you here. I don't know why some of you keep coming to Crossland. I don't know why some people kept following Jesus even after he had died. But I do know this, he was the reason they were there. And he's the reason that you're here today. Let us give everything we have, everything we have, just like that man gave away his treasure. Let us get rid of everything we have so that we can claim Christ. Let's pray today. God, thank you so much for who you are. God, for the way that you love us, for sending your one and only son to die, Jesus. You sent him on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem with a purpose. God, such a plan, a great and powerful plan, Jesus. And nobody that day knew that Jesus was riding in to be crucified, but he knew that. He knew that he was about to save the world. And we take that gift today, Jesus. We say, thank you. Thank you for that. Let us stay gathered together in this place, God, and wherever we go for that one purpose always, to proclaim the gospel. We love you, we thank you. It's in your name that we pray, amen. As you give this morning, financially, there are many different ways that you can give. Number one, to your right or to your left is an envelope. You can put cash or check in there, just right on the front if you would fill it out. And drop it off at any of our offering baskets in our lobbies as you leave today. Um, you can also scan the QR code and give that way online. That's the best way for you to give right now as we um, join in this part of service. So just scan that QR code, click on give, and you can give that way, uh, recurring or just a one-time payment. But thank you, church, for being generous. I know we keep telling you that, and we will never stop telling you that because you guys are incredible. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your gift. I'm gonna run through a few quick announcements, okay? Number one, obviously do not forget Easter is next weekend. Those service times are on the front of your bulletin. Share that please. Invite all your people. We would love to see all of our services filled up from a Maundy Thursday service, which I'll talk about in just a minute, all the way through to Sunday at 11 o'clock. We wanna see this room full of people celebrating Jesus. So invite your friends, your family, your coworkers, let them know, save a seat for Forum. We would love to see you all here. That Monday, Thursday service that I'm speaking of, that'll be Thursday night for our legacy group. So that's 55 and up. We're gonna have a service, it'll be absolutely incredible. 
We're going to have a time of worship. Um, Greg will speak a little bit as we go into uh, Good Friday, and then we'll pray over all of our campuses and all our spaces before new people and old people come back into the building and celebrate Easter. So please, please, please be a part of that. If you're in that legacy age, we would love, love, love for you to be there, okay? Number two, we need volunteers specifically for Easter. Um, We know that spring break kind of lines up with Easter this year, and so we've had a few call outs and need need volunteers specifically for Easter Sunday. So if that is something that you feel called to, that you'd potentially be interested in, email Kristen at crossland.tv. Her email is on there. We would love to have you serve and you know serve continuing, but if you can just serve that Easter Sunday, that would be amazing. Um, just email her and let her know, okay? Our parent conference, Equip, is coming up. The very first one here at Crossland. Very excited about it. At the beginning of the year, we talked about ways in which we want Crossland to grow and things we wanted to focus on, and one of those things was parents. We wanna equip parents and let them know that we are with them, we are a resource for them. We wanna stand right by you as you try to raise your children. So that conference is gonna be incredible. It's a two-day conference. We'll have dinner that Friday night together as we set everything up and then breakouts and so many resources that you can have on Saturday, okay? So sign up for that. There is a cost, but don't let that stop you. And if it does stop you, please email me, savannah at crossland.tv and let me know. We will get that taken care of, okay? Last thing on there is curbside. They are starting April 11th and they need volunteers. That is something you're interested in. Please email Leslie. Her email is on there. We would love to have you. Um, In particular, they need volunteers for the crosswalk. I don't know if you've ever been to curbside, but kids are going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth all the time. So we would love for them to be protected and safe. So if you can do that, please let us know. We are diving right into week three of this incredible series that will take us to next Sunday. Sunday, Easter. Let's prepare our heart and our mind for teaching today. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him down on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. They led him away to crucify him. believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him nothing in his appearance that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by mankind he was a a man of suffering and very familiar with pain like one from whom people hide their faces he was despised and we held him in low esteem Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, it is we who are healed. You see, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he never opened his mouth. He was led like a a lamb to the slaughter as, as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he never opened his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation ever stood there and protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there ever any deceit found in his mouth. Yet, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will yet see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. 
After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. It's Isaiah 53. Approximately 550 to 600 years before the execution of Jesus Christ, the prophet Isaiah gives us this incredible look into what was going to happen in that moment. And there's something powerful about being able not to just safely predict what that moment's going to be like. That's powerful in and of itself, but there's something in this image of what we see that Matthew is going to capitalize on, that we need to capitalize on, is that even from that moment, and we understand really all the moments before that, but since sin in the garden, momentum has been leading to a certain moment of time, that there are thousands of years of these individual moments that are coming all together with this powerful momentum, all going to apex in a single solitary moment on a Friday in which Isaiah, 600 years before that moment, clearly declares not just what is going to happen in that moment, but that moment is going to have if you could extrapolate the meaning out of the, the maniacal bloodthirsty moment, it's going to declare something so significant for not only universal truth, but for individual life living. That's what Matthew's audience needed to know. They needed to know like in their lifetime, they were sensing this feel that they were being overwhelmed by the momentum of life and that it was coming at them from every angle that there was just obviously the religious side of things was no longer working for them. And that which God had originally intended to bring life to this earth was producing nothing but death. And that's why Jesus confronted the Pharisees and said, you're nothing more than whitewashed tombs. You're full of dead man's bones. There's no life within you. You're, you're clean on the outside because you know how to wash your cup, but you're filthy on the inside. There's no life coming from you. And here's the Jew that... Whew, finally found life in Christ, separates themselves from the synagogue, and now they're out here in you know, no man's land trying to figure out how they integrate into a predominantly, if you will, Gentile movement in AD 70. But even in those moments, it isn't just all the momentum of religion and the animosities that they're feeling because of it coming against them. You now have the full power of Rome once again coming at them. You can imagine living right after AD 70 where after you've watched Rome and the, the worst that governments can possibly do and invade a city and destroy it and its inhabitants, destroy its centers of worship and its inhabitants in that as well. But it isn't just, you know, religion in Rome. It's crowds and mobs of people that hate them. It's just like, it, it's like the trinity of stupidity if you think about it. I mean, it's just coming from all angles. And when you think about 2024, if you stop and think about it, the irony, the irony, I hope it is not lost on you, the tragic, disgusting, deplorable demonstration once again of man at its worst in, in, in uh, the outskirts of Moscow this week. You see, we, uh, two years ago now, or maybe more, the mis guided use of governmental power where one nation invades the sovereign boundaries and borders of another and save your emails because I really don't care to discuss it with you. It is never right for one nation to willfully, unless they're trying to protect themselves and Russia invading Ukraine, there's no making any sense of that. It's wrong. So you see government go awry, but that very government apparently is now experiencing the sting of religious gone awry, religion gone awry with ISIS taking credit, a completely misguided demonstration of what true passion for God would look like. And going into the, a city, a, just a, a concert hall to listen to a group that plays classic rock. And you just decide that those human lives are not worth the passion that you express. If it is them, then they say they've taken credit. 
It's just insane to watch when, if you will, religion and <laughs> when governmental powers, and they compete, they confront, they fight. It's even worse when they partner, and you'll see that today. And sometimes it's just out and out mob violence. You just watch crowds of people. It is a known fact that individual people will behave in crowds in ways they would never behave alone, that were so easily, quickly swayed by the momentums of this world. And on this Friday, that we, this coming Friday, the Friday that, you know, 600 years before it happened, Isaiah spoke of, the one that we're going to contemplate this week, 2,000 years removed, it is that very moment when everything that stands opposed to God came together, the perfect storm. It is the moment when the momentum of human history comes together where you'll see today very quickly, you will see just the misguided religious leaders making really terrible choices. You will see Rome complicit with blood on their hands trying to wash it off, but that's not possible. They participate in this maniacal demonstration of man at his worst. And then, no, it isn't. It's the people, too. Because you're going to get a crowd who, seven days earlier on this day, Palm Sunday, are saying, praise him, praise him, praise him. And Friday, they're saying, crucify, crucify, crucify. You got a city full of people that are saying, hallelujah, on Sunday, and kill them on Friday. I know. And that's the world you and I live in right now. It's the world as it's always been. And that might, maybe you're not dealing with an epic moment. You're just dealing with your own moment. And all the momentum of life seems to be coming together. Like, you know, it's like, okay, I'm good. I'm, it's like you, I'm, I'm not, not just explaining, my marriage is fabulous. But you can imagine if you have relational difficulties, financial difficulties, and physical difficulties, and they all come together in one moment. I agree. That's exactly what, see, somebody's got some amen in them today, okay? So it is, but could it be, I don't know, I, I'm suspecting many of you have been watching the wrong NCAA tournament this weekend. Uh, well, some of you probably wish you were watching a different tournament. I'm not going to say who. Um, but men's and women's basketball. But I personally, phenomenal, don't get me wrong. But I think you're doing yourself, honestly, I mean this to the core of who I am, an injustice if you don't turn to ESPN and watch some of the NCAA national championships in wrestling. Because it is some of the, mo the fiercest, most intense nine minutes you will ever see in your life. It is grueling. Uh, it is phenomenal. There is something about man-on-man uh, -man competition and one of the keys to MMA, mixed martial arts, whether it's judo, karate, boxing, kickboxing, Greco-Roman style wrestling is what you will see. That's what's practiced in, you know, in Olympic wrestling style. That's what I did uh, all throughout middle school, high school, and into college. Um, you will find the key, the key to success in all of that, if you will, grappling type of thing, is the ability to use your opponent's strength against them is to use their energy to your advantage, is to understand that the greatest thing to do in the face of strength and opposition is often to go with it, okay? We naturally tend to want to immediately oppose it, where if we would just use the opposition strength and energy cleverly, that's all that judo is is me making you act in a way that's aggressive so I can use it against you. In wrestling, if you watch it, those guys are trying to set their opponent up. They're just trying to get them to flinch or move. And as soon as they do, you take advantage of it. If they come at you, seriously, if you've never taken a self-defense class, here's the simplest thing to do when a person charges at you. How many of you have ever taken dance classes with your wife? Right? You know who's leading? The one who's going backwards. Not the one who's going, the one who's doing the pushing ain't leading. It's the one who's taking that energy. They're the one, see? And I've never had a dance class. And you're like, you didn't have to tell us that. Right? 
It's the one who takes the energy of the person pushing. Guarantee it. Seriously, like, I'm a little guy. But if you come put your hand on my chest, we're, listen, and st- I'm going to let you push me. Because then all you, you have two great hinges that God has given you called your knees. Let them push. Use the energy. Then drop your knees. That's all you got to do. And boom. I'm serious. I don't care if you're 220. Now, I'm not going to beat them when they're down there. I'm going to bite them. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I got you now where I want you. Your hand's here and you're down there. You're going to lose a digit. I, you're like, no, you wouldn't. No, I would. I will spit that blood back in your face. And I'm taking that finger with me right to the police. I'm saying, I don't know who he is, but here's his fingerprint. Because my goal is to survive. That's it. That's all you do in Greco-Roman wrestling. Is I want you to use all, you realize that no people can last 60 seconds in a fist fight. I guarantee you I can go at least three minutes. All I got to do is let you burn yourself out. And anybody who's in the police department, and I won't point them out, they'll tell you I'm right. Just let them punch. Because about 60 seconds, their arms are down here. It's like, now, now that you've swung at me, this is self-defense. No, it is. Yeah, and this is true with what God's going to do in the crucifixion. He's going to let man punch himself out. He's going to use all of that energy and all of that animosity, all of that hatred, all in one moment and just go, oh. Now I got death, hell, sin, sickness right where I've always wanted it. Right where I've always wanted it. And I'm telling you, if we get this principle down, there is no situation you will face. I'm not telling you, you don't have a fight on your hands. What I'm telling you is, we fight differently. The hardest thing for most human beings when facing opposition is to give way. No way. I am not giving way. I would tell you that is probably most often the smartest thing you can possibly do, is get out of the way. Y'all go home today, get on YouTube, look at your judo. You'll see I'm not kidding. You got to get out of the way. You got to use all that. See, can adversity be an accelerant? Can opposition actually be an opportunity? Matthew 27 says yes. And while this is a historical factual moment, the principles that we glean from it are phenomenally profound for everyday living, okay? So today's big idea, you can trust God's sovereignty, I guarantee it, to use the momentum of life that's coming against you to transform the life before you. I guarantee it, okay? And we're gonna see this truth play out. You're gonna see religion, Rome, and the crowd. And you're gonna see what gets unleashed because all Jesus does is let them have their way. It's all he's got to do, is let them have their way. Matthew 27. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. Now, I just read you Isaiah 53, 600 years before that. Who's making plans here? I know what we'll do. Let's lay down some plans to have him executed. And God's like, I already planned that. And all I'm going to do is use your religious hatred and animosity to my advantage. I'm going to leverage all of that. I don't got to come down here and demonstrate all my power. I'm going to use your power against you. You see, it looks like what we have here, and it is true, the execution of the sinless son of God. That is true. But more than anything, it's the execution of a sovereign plan of God. And God is, it's kind of like, remember, what was it, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, rope-a-dope, just sitting in a corner? The, what was that? It wasn't in a minute. I mean, George Foreman, boom, boom, punching him. I mean, no human being could possibly sustain that. And Muhammad's just back there taking it, watch it, man, beating him to death. And then finally, round seven, George Foreman, like, Muhammad Ali's like, okay, bam, 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 boom, 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 out. He had to take seven, eight rounds of a merciless beating. But he punched himself out. He just stood in there and said, go ahead. Crazy, isn't it? That's this. 
They're simply cooperating. They're responsible. Man's not, he's autonomous. He's not automated. Man is just using their unnatural inclinations to his advantage, which will ultimately be to theirs. And when you and I begin to think about the plans of the world that seemingly, not even seemingly, are going, trying to work against the purposes of God, what you have to understand God is not going to do, he will one day in the second coming. But don't expect God to come down and be like, woo-hoo. God's going to be like, oh. You want to go back here? Okay, great. Let's go back here. You want to go back here? And guess where he's leading them to? Right to the second coming. You think you're in control of your life. That's great. You've been executing your plan. And your plan is to execute the purposes of God for your life. You think you're in control. And God's like, I'm letting you think that. Because the moment's coming. When all I'm going to do is use all of that momentum and go, boom. Have I got your attention? Because what he could do is just crush you like he did his son. He's not. And he's not playing games with you. He's playing, using your momentum against you game. Because if he can pin you, he can deliver you. That's their plan, okay? So God can execute his plan for us in a world that is constantly working against us. And sometimes there are times, don't get me wrong, we gotta rise up, I get that. But most often in life, we gotta step to the side. That's not quitting. That is using the energy of the forces that are against you for you, okay? And I could probably do a series on how do you apply that in parenting. I, I guarantee, I promise you, start thinking more about not necessarily trying to oppose. Doesn't mean you're going along to get along. It means you're using the very means the world is trying to use against you for you. Because somewhere in the Bible, I think it might be Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says, and my God causes all things to work together for our good. Somewhere in my Bible, I believe it's right when out of the mouth of Joseph in the book of Genesis, what you intended for, God intended for right. So after the, the chief priest and the elders, the CPE is what I like to call them. The CPE comes up with their plan. They go to the RGA, the Roman governmental authority. And if you get CPE plus RGA, this is what you get, train wreck. You will never have anything positive happen when you get the CPE and the RGA together. Because if you get religious authorities together with governmental authorities to create a philosophy for how the world could be better, we're in serious trouble, okay? We should certainly be a part of partnering in government offices and serving together, certainly. But the government is not the means by which we're going to bring about the advancement of the kingdom. The Jews and their leadership thought, you know what we're going to do? We're going to use the government to advance our cause. That is always going to be a train wreck. So they bring Jesus before Pilate because as much power as they have, they still can't execute anybody, okay? So when Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, he's now, he is the, the authority, okay? He's a governor, plate in place by Caesar. When he sits down, boom, whatever he says goes. All the authority in that moment is right in his lap. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, Jesus, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. His wife has some insight into this, nothing more other than insight, okay? But the chief priest and the elders persuaded. See, they see the wife talking. So they go to what? The crowd. So now you have a trinity of stupidity, if you really think about it. You've already got, you know, you've got the CPE, you got the RGA, and now you got the crowd. And you get those three together, it's amazing how much you can accomplish. You, they literally can do almost, in fact, do anything you want to do. You want to kill the Son of God? You get those three together, you can pull it off. Pull it off. In an afternoon. You don't even need a week. In fact, you only need six hours. You don't even have a day. Six hours and you can kill the Son of God. Well, how could I kill the Son of God? Get the local government authority and whoever's in charge. Get the local religious authority and whoever's in charge. And they get a mob full of uncontrollable people. <laughs> Not that hard. You can really, you can do a lot in six hours. It's 
crazy, isn't it? And this is who's together. So they've influenced the crowd. See, they had a tradition on that day of Passover when everybody was in town. See, what Pilate, it probably didn't start with him, but Pilate would do because normally there might be 20,000 people in Jerusalem. During a feast like Passover, there might be 200,000. Okay, and on this day, there's probably a thousand Roman soldiers in the city, maybe a little less. So they are definitely outnumbered. So in order to keep the peace, and they would get one Jewish prisoner and release them on that day. See, see, we're we're friends here. We want to work with you. So they got a guy by the name of Jesus Barabbas. Is his name Jesus Barabbas? And his name, if you take Bar Abbas apart, Bar means son of Abba. So the first guy you got, Jesus, son of father. The second guy is Jesus, son of God. Right. Isn't that awesome? Who do you want to release? Now, Barabbas, we know, is an insurrectionist. Barabbas, we know from the terminology used, he's a thief. He's robbed and he's killed. He's an insurrectionist. In fact, he'll steal anything from you. He'll kill you to steal from you if you have to, okay? So the governor says, who do you want me to release? And so the crowd screams out, Barabbas, they answered. Now, who do you, you're there that day. You want Jesus, son of father, to be released? Or do you want Jesus, son of God, released? Who do you want released? Right? If you say Jesus, son of God, you've given the wrong answer. Because if we release him, you never get forgiven. They released the right guy. You realize that, right? They didn't even realize God. what God is using is their own stupidity for them. God knew, hey, we make them the all. This is, can you imagine the Trinity having this conversation before God ever created anything? You know what's going to happen that day they try and kill you, Jesus? They're all going to come here. And you know what they're going to want to do that day they kill you? They're going to want to kill you. Well, you didn't think we'd have to talk them into it, did you? Well, no, I didn't. I just wanted you to know when you get there, you're not going to have to talk them into it. You're not, you're not going to have to convince you. Jesus didn't have to go to Rome and say, you need to kill me. Never said it. Never got up there before the crowd. Think about it. Hey, uh, um, y'all, the, the, let him go. Kill me. And they're like, no, no, you're an innocent man. We don't want to let a murderer go. No, 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 no. No, no, let him go. Kill me. <laughs> never happened. Like there was never an argument as to who to release. You know why? Because God was just using their natural momentum against them. Because he knew that's how he can do the best thing for them. Who wants to release a murderer? Nobody. Except the mob crowd who's thinking stupidly. God said, that's all I needed you to do. Because you know what God did in that moment? He didn't force his will. He just stepped out of the way. That's all he did. Judo, man. It's the best judo move that there is. You just got to go watch. You take a half a step off center, okay? This is, I'm telling you, this is the part of, great part of greco Rome. There's your center line. Always just a half step off center. That changes the match at all times, just so you know that. You're being attacked, a half a step off center always changes everything. If someone's coming at you, don't step back. A half a step off center changes everything. A half a step off center changes everything. Okay? Everybody wants to do this, wrong direction. You're now in a position. Now they got to turn to you. Everything changed right there. And what are they yelling? No, 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 no. Because Pilate's thinking logically at this point of all the people. What shall I do then with Jesus who's called the Messiah? They said, well, you should crucify him. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder because crowds, they don't think right. Crucify him. Crucify him. And it looks like the mob is winning. Exactly. It looks like they're winning. God's just using their natural tendencies against themselves. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead of an uproar starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. So you see Pilate's motivation now is the one thing they want to do is keep a lid on things. He's afraid of an uproar. So what he decides to do, he thinks, is use his authority to avoid an uproar. And God's like, no, that's not what you're doing. I'm allowing you to use your authority to send my son to the cross. That's what I'm doing. 
You're, you're doing it for one reason, I'm telling you, it's ultimately for another. So he stands up and he washes his hands in front of the crowd. And he says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. Partly true. But the truth of the matter is, there's just some things you can never wash from your own hands. He wasn't a robot. He's still responsible. Everybody's responsible for the choices they make in the moment. Everybody's responsible. So he washes his hands. And we have this God who's able to use religion at its worst, government power and authority at its absolute worst, mob mentality at its worst. Are you beginning to see God is capable that what the crucifixion, that moment was, was this, this moment where God was using all that momentum. And instead of coming down in force, he just stepped to the side and let it go the way it was going because he knew that was going to be ultimately what was ultimately best for humanity. So God can transform the power of a man to release the wrong things. He really can. Be very careful not to interpret something way too soon that gets released into our world earlier than we thought. We can identify it, we can clearly explain it, but you gotta be really careful, okay? Because God may release something in your life you're thinking, I would never have released a murderer. And God's like, I know, because that's you thinking. But what you gotta do sometimes is, in the face of my will, go my way, go my, go my way, go with it. Go with it. And that's the last thing we want to do, right? When life comes at us and it grabs you by the shirt, the first thing we start with, <laughs> instead of grabbing that, you know what you do? And go the way they want you to do. Take a step, a step, hinge, bam. So I'm telling you that I don't care if they're 250 pounds. Because you start going their way, they're going to give you everything they got, and all you got to do is hinge those knees, man. They're coming with you. And when you get them down, what do we do? We bite as hard as is humanly possible. This isn't MMA, and you start pounding and hope the ref calls the fight. This is survive. Girls, you hear me. Any male puts a hand on you. You bite that digit off. You got gouges, whatever you got to do. You do it to survive. And here's what we want to do. It's hard to go with it. It's hard to go with a diagnosis. Now, I want to fight against it. Now, it doesn't mean we quit. That's not what happened. Jesus didn't quit. It says sometimes we got to use the momentum of the things that are coming against us because at a moment they're stronger than us, but then we ultimately are now in control. We know where this thing's going because you think you're winning. But that, the minute a person thinks they're winning, they're going to lose. You drop that hip and I'm telling you, it's going to change quickly. What about with your kids and your health and your fight, the world? What, like, seriously, what are we going to do this year with an election? You know what most Christians are going to do? When a Democrat grabs a Republican by the shirt, I, you Joe Biden, fuck you, you vote for Joe Biden. Biden, you knucklehead, he's a thief and hunter's a coke smoking, dope dealing, pornographic star of a human being. Right? You get a Republican grabbing a Democrat. Donald Trump's got the worst hair I've ever seen on a human being. And no, I, I'm sure I don't trust my money with Biden, but I wouldn't trust my wife with Trump. You just, right? How about, if you grab my shirt this year about the election, here's where I'm going. And then the day after the election, I'm going to go, Poof. aren't you glad Jesus is on the throne? Come on, church, let's take this with us this year. You know, Because you know what the devil wants? The devil wants me and you to fight. He wants you to get in my grill and be like, dude, don't you get in my face. I'm American. I got a right to vote. I got me a First Amendment. I got me a Second Amendment. A third. Don't know what it says. I got me a fourth. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I know eight is 
cruelty punishment? <laughs> I don't have, I have the right to a trial by grand jury or something like that. Dude, we're just talking about the president. Right. Let's just let the world take us where it wants. Because you know what? Either goofball that wins. Listen, here's where we're at. If this is the best we have to offer, we need Jesus. Right? Can we not agree? It's the best we got. So I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. I love you. I'm going to passionately disagree with you, but I ain't fighting with you. I don't want to see. I, listen, seriously, it is not worth our breath. Because on the day after the election, Christ is on his throne. And let's just take the world. Be like, yeah, keep screaming. Keep fighting. Please, please, please. Because the day after, we're going to have the whole world's attention and say, so, did you get what you wanted? Great. But what you really need is Jesus Christ. Because the solution is never going to be found in an election. Mm. Right. Can you imagine being Matthew's people with Rome at their throat? They burned their entire city and killed all of its inhabitants in AD 70. They burned the most sacred space of worship on the face of the earth to the ground, the temple, and it's not been yet rebuilt. And it seemed for all intents and purposes the world had them by the throat. And then in 1948, God was like, you've been wrong, you're so wrong. You're so wrong. Bam, I'm still God. Right. So Jesus is led away by the Praetorian Guard. They gather together with the whole company of soldiers around him, which is probably about 900 of them. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. You know what one of the world's favorite weapons against followers of Jesus Christ? Mockery. Mockery. But what's so amazing about God is he's even able to take outright vile mockery and reveal how much biblical accuracy there actually is in it. So what color robe did they put on him? Not green. They didn't say, hey, you're a leprechaun. Purple. The color of royalty. Oh, they're mocking him, no doubt about it. But we know. We know who the king of kings is, don't we? See, Christians, I don't want to be cloaked in mockery any more than you do. But the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of accuracy in their mockery. Bring it on. See, you're just a bunch of self-righteous people. No, 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 no. Hold, take the self out, keep the righteous. If you think I'm a righteous person, you're right. I'm not self-righteous, I'm Christ-righteous. You're holier than now. Now, I'm not holier than now, but I am holy. There's some truth in that. You're a bunch of judgmental people. No, no, I'm not judgmental, but I do have the biblical right to judge you. No, you're right. There's some, see, all the mockery has some accuracy. Only God can take vile mockery and turn it into absolute accuracy. So it's a, it's a, a purple robe, and then what do they put on his head? A crown. Who wears the crown? The king. So they've just dressed the king in mockery. And God's like, no, they didn't. They actually dressed him in accuracy. And here's what we want to do at that moment. Don't you go calling me no hypocrite. I ain't no hypocrite. No, I am not. And if you're a follower, you can't be. But we are blatantly inconsistent. I mean, if you're looking at my life and saying, Pharaoh, sometimes you really live a good life and sometimes you're a real idiot. I'd say, you are absolutely right. I am not a hypocrite. I am a blatantly inconsistent human being who is not capable of living faithfully every moment of my life. I have some, and the only reason you're able to call me inconsistent, think about this, is because I've had some streaks of good consistency. The only question you can, the only reason you can question my character now is because you've seen good character then. The only reason why you're disappointed in me now is because you've seen a different standard then. Because if I was always a dirtbag, and I'm being a dirt bag, there's no reason to be upset that I'm a dirt bag because I'm always a dirt bag. You know who the one human being was that had perfect integrity? Hitler. Perfectly evil all the time. Never had a surprising good moment, not one. 
Like nobody should have been surprised because he had perfect integrity. Now you and I, we don't, hey, like the next time somebody says, man, I think you're a hypocrite. No, no, I'm just a blatantly inconsistent follower of Jesus Christ. You caught me in not living up to the standard. But apparently you must have seen me living up to it at a previous moment or you wouldn't have had anything to compare it to. Huh. And if nothing else, you've proven you know there's a standard. How are you doing living up to it? Oh, so you're blatantly inconsistent as well? They put a staff in his right hand, the power hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. <laughs> he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Being found in human likeness, he became obedient, obedient to the point of death and that death being on a cross. That at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know who the first people were to ever take a knee to that reality to fulfill Philippians chapter two? Those knuckleheads. Right there in that moment, they got on a knee and said, hail king of the Jews. That will not be the last time they get on that knee. It was the first time. And they can either get on it before he comes back or they'll be forced on it when he returns. You have two choices. Because that position right there, every person's going to end up in one day. You ain't mocking me, Bubby. You're just simply pro prophesying for me. Every knee will bow. Think about that. I mean, how much more do we need to see the capacities of God to take all the momentum that's against me if I will just do what Jesus did, go with it. Could it be the moment where God is going to transform it for me? That in all the strength I might have to oppose it is not going to conquer it, but to go along with it, trusting the sovereignty of God might very well be the thing that I need. Like what? that what are you going to do in that moment when all the momentum of the consequences of your sin comes at you? What are you going to do? Confront it? Or go with it? Step out of the way and let Christ absorb it. Oh, you're going to stand up there and you're going you're to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God? You're done. The minute you try and oppose him, he will destroy you. The only thing to do is what Jesus said, did. As a lamb is silent before its shears, so Christ was silent before his accusers. I would tell you the best thing to do is button up, step aside, and let the wrath that was intended for you go right by you and be absorbed by him. But if you want to do it, have at it. What are we going to do when that health crisis? I know. Listen, I know. I'm about done with it. I was in the hospital again this week. I get it. If I pulled my shirt up and showed you my arms right now, you'd think somebody beat me. They're so bruised. I get it. I can't, I can't fight off heart disease. I got to go with it. What I got to do is be able to adjust. I got to take that half step. If I try and wrestle it, it will pin my back to the ground. I got to accept it. I got to go with it. I mean, six years ago, to be good gracious, many of you don't, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I've been to the, to the edge. And then my wife. Now we got no quit in us. None. But we're tired. We've been fighting since 2018. I mean, we've been asked to step aside and let, and let massive brain surgery have to happen to my wife. And, I don't even know how many thoracic procedures I've had.
And, and, and again, that's why I look at you and I say, listen, I am not. We live the same life you do. I'm no different than you, man. I, I, I Listen, honestly. I got clay feet just like you do. I cry. I've got pains and problems. But what I will not do is quit. I will not quit. I will not quit. I will not quit. In high school, when I wrestled, there was a sign on the ceiling. I'll never forget it. This is what it said. If you can read this, you've already lost. Because the last place a wrestler ever needs to find himself is on his back. And you look up and you read that and it says, if you can read this, you've already lost. Sure. But you, I, I ain't going to my back. I'll bite its finger off if I have to. <laughs> I'm telling you. You too. They spit on him. They took a staff and they struck him in the head again and again. And after they mocked him, they took off his robe and put his clothes on him. They led him away. And they crucified him. And God let them. And Jesus let them. He wasn't swept away as some powerless pawn. He he was practicing an unbelievably significant spiritual truth. Sometimes you've got to step to the side and let the momentum think it's winning. Let the attacker think he's got the strength just so that you can get them where you want them. And then you can pin them to the ground. And in this moment, Jesus has false, lifeless religion right where he wants it. And in this moment, Jesus has the most powerful government authority on the face of that earth in that day right where he wants them. Jesus has got an uncontrollable crowd and mob of people who are easily led by passion right where he wants them. Right where he wants them. And I know for Greg and Tammy Farrell, God has us right where he wants us. Right here at Crossland Community Church pastor and the greatest people on the face of the earth. And if we got to eat a little bit of the dirt and dust of this world to serve these people, give me a dirt sandwich, man. Because I ain't going nowhere. I'm not, I'm not on my back. Now, I don't want you walking out here, oh, that poor fella. That nah, ain't me. I'll bite your finger off. That is not me. <laughs> okay? Watch what happens. At the moment of his death, and I want you, listen, Isaiah 53 this week, meditate on it. But think about this. Think about this. At that moment, 5,000 years of human history, an unmeasured amount of eternity, 600 plus years of prophecy, that moment, that moment, the, the moment. When all the momentum is coming to an head, it's that moment, you know, right? You, we all have those moments. It's like at that moment, at that moment of his death, when he breathed his last, the thing the world and the earth had been waiting for, the desperate cries of the patriarchs who are waiting for someone to fully, finally redeem the sin of Israel. That moment, what happens? Well, God shows religion that you thought you had the upper hand. And what I did through lifeless religion was take it and pin it. And I took a curtain and I ripped it from top to bottom. Because all I did was use all the animosity of lifeless religion all in one moment and turned it down and gave everybody instant access for all eternity. You want to come to the Father? You come. You don't come any way you want. You come in the name of Jesus Christ or you don't come at all. 
He forever showed, I will show you what I will do with the momentum of lifeless religion. I will create instant relationship. And the only reason you got there is because Jesus just went with it. He went with it. The earth shook. The rocks split. And the tombs opened. Like the first post-death resurrection of Jesus Christ, this might surprise you, was not Sunday morning. It was Friday afternoon. Because they think they're bringing about death. And God's like, I know you do. That's why I'm going along with it. Well, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to put death on its back. And immediately the graves begin to empty. Bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. In other words, they got raised from the dead and they stayed in the cemetery. That word tomb is a cow. They're not going into town until... They're not the first ones into Jerusalem. Jesus is. But they're the first ones out of the grave. It's unbelievable. And they went into the holy city and they appeared to many people. Rome thinks it has the ability and the power to bring about death. And Jesus is like, I'm going to let you think that. Religion thinks, we got a plan. We're going to execute a plan to execute the son. And they're like, yeah, you think that. Boom. Right there in that moment. When the centurion and those with him regarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Listen, God can unleash the power of life to overcome every moment of death throughout our life. Death of a job, death of a dream, death of your health, death of a marriage, literal death of a loved one. And the only way when we can survive in the moment, the moment, the moment is to go with it. Get out of the way. Let God do with the moment and the momentum what only he can do. Step out of the way and let him pin it and transform it. What are you going to do with your sin? What are you going to do with your sin? Stand up and and battle the full onslaught of the wrath of God? I think not. Go with it. Go with it. Get out of the way. Someone's standing right there to absorb it. What are you going to do with the craziness of America in 2025? We're going to go with it. We're going to go with it. And then we're going to take advantage of it. Not so we can show everybody we're right and pin them on their backs, but to show them how powerful God is to put them back up on their feet. What are you going to do in that moment? There's only one thing to do. Get out of the way and let God have his way. Because he's the one who shakes the foundations of this earth and breaks open the tombs of life. Get out of the way. Just get out of the way. Father, we love you. We thank you. You're a wonderful God. Powerful. Almighty and holy. And if you wanted to come against us, you easily could, but you've demonstrated clearly you came for us. All we need to do is get out of your way. Because you want to pin death, sickness, sin, Satan, sorrow, and hell to the mat. You want them to tap out, not us. And they have, and they will. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray to you and all of God's people said, amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise in his house today. Well, that was a lot of fun. May the God of heaven richly bless each and every one of you.
Go have a great day.